Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this session from me, Andrew Mowat, all about the challenges of the first 30 days of leadership, middle leadership in particular, and especially those who are new to leadership, new to role, new to team, or new to school. This is a discussion, if you like, a presentation about some elements of leadership especially the first period of leadership, particularly for young and new leaders, but also uh, relevant to those who are existing leaders and want to start a team engagement to drive a body of work with effectiveness and with real purpose that generates a really powerful culture of, de of development and learning in teams, in schools. So this is a conversation about those first 30 days. I am going to be looking at various parts of my screen. I've got a big setup here. And I'm looking uh, to other parts to be able to click the next slide. I'm not sharing a screen. I'm simply using an app that I'm happy to talk about later on to deliver the slides behind me like this. And in so doing, this is a, a body of work first um, exposed by this author, Michael Watkins, around the first 90 days. And in many ways, I've adapted the idea of this body of work by Michael, which is particularly focused on senior leadership in the corporate setting. And I've adjusted the time frame we're talking about, and I've adjusted some of the focus areas of strategy that we might be working through as well. So just before we start to go into this, this is a very strange environment to be delivering. It's a very one-way environment when it's just one person presenting. So I'm presenting to the camera and not really knowing if I'm talking to anyone out there in the big wild world, both here on um, StreamYard, on the various LinkedIn channels, and on our YouTube channels, including both EduSpark and of course, uh, partnering with Ed Events. So this might be reaching you on a number of channels. And I may not be speaking to anyone in particular. I may be speaking to a large bunch of people. So I invite you just to jump on and say hello right now and to just maybe pop in whereabouts you are in the world. And that will come through into my feed as we progress. This will be available as a recording and will also be available inside the course, the program of development that I'll be talking about in this, this particular chat with you and about the, the ongoing development that I, the work I do with middle leadership in schools. So thanks, Craig. I knew you'd be jumping on. I really appreciate that. And it's good to get the feedback that it's working. Um, it's one of those funny non-feedback situations when often we rely so heavily on feedback coming back from people. Thank you, Craig, my friend. So before we get into the body of work, a little bit about me, although this is much more about middle leaders, new middle leaders, especially coming up to the next academic year. I'm co-founder with Craig Kemp uh, of EduSpark, a professional learning platform. I'm also the principal partner of Metal Learn Education, which is all about delivery of leadership based education, feedback, coaching, those sorts of elements. I deliver coaching myself and I've had a long history uh, in education. I often joke that I was uh, born, sorry, Craig was born, not me, Craig was born the year that I started teaching. So I'm one of those crusty old journeymen of education. Welcome Doha, great to have you along. Hi Ritika, thank you very much for joining and maybe pop in where you are joining from in the world. So now that you've got to know who I am, and if you want to know more, I'll have email contacts and you can find me on LinkedIn, look at my profile. You can see the sort of work I, I love to do. Uh, and I love to play in that space of evidence, neuroscience, leadership, conversations that matter and technology. And that's that's the world I like to play in. So I was saying that this, this work by Michael Watkins here is based largely with really valuable piece of work, but the context is a longer frame of development than we often get in that year of work with a, an educational team. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate you jumping in. Good old Queensland, one of my favourite parts in the world. By the way, I'm coming to you from sunny Singapore, and it is sunny and hot today. In education, I don't think we've got the privilege of working in longer time frames, and so therefore the first 90-day concept is reframed in our context to the first 30 days. In any case, the 90-day period for a school is the whole of the first term. And I don't believe we've got 
the opportunity to set culture, set mission, set ways of working in the first term. I think we've got a much shorter period of time in which we can bring influence to bear in our program of work as a leader, particularly a new to role, new to school or new to team leader. And so we've got um, a much shorter availability, maybe our week before the school year starts, and then our first three to four weeks, which really makes us around the 30-day mark, the opportunity we've got to set three key strategies in play that optimises and in many ways, simplifies what is a complex role in a school. It doesn't make it simple, but it certainly simplifies it. But before we get into the first 30 days and the three strategies, I want to really interrogate you about what is the value. Why do we meet as teams? And if you're watching this, feel free to jump into the chat and add what you think here. What might be the value of a teacher team, a team of, say, year two teachers, um, a team of mathematics teachers, some sort of organisation around a common role, year level or subject area, for instance, or other domains of work. What is that value of organising ourselves into teacher teams? It's the way we've been for seemingly a long time. But I can tell you, when I first started working in education, it was a much more polar, bipolar, if you like, it was leadership and then teachers. And basically, the senior leader, the principal in the school may have had an assistant, may not have had. And that one person tended to be older and male, and they tended to be quite didactic and, and um, command and controlled in their nature. It was unusual to be involved in a school that had a culture other than that in the 80s. Early into the 90s was when I first experienced this idea of a teacher team. And so, therefore, there must be some advantage to organising ourselves in teams. And what is the purpose and the value? And, again, inviting you to add some comments into here. For me, the value of a teacher team and the purpose of a teacher team are slightly different. The value is the capacity to collaborate and bring neurologically diverse, not neurodiverse in the sense that we understand neurodiversity, but that sense of bringing different brains to the table in order to solve complex issues and demands. Education has certainly complexified, if I can say that, in the journey of the last 25 years. And there are many more things that we need to attend to as teachers in a classroom, a hugely demanding role which is way more than what I was taught when I first began in teaching, which was to have a body of knowledge to transmit to a bunch of kids. For me, in 1984, sorry, Craig, I've given away your birth there. 1984 is, uh, is the year that I started this, and I was all about delivering my body of knowledge of science and biology to a bunch of kids in my classrooms. It's spot on Doha. We do thrive through collaboration. There is actually a social need. It's one of um, the hierarchy of needs that we have. And often it's the very foundational hierarchy that we have to be connected to others. So it's a natural disposition we have in terms of organisation. And we've started to see that this plays into a much stronger purpose. So here might be what you could think of as the purpose. So jumping ahead, too many slides there. So if the value of teacher teams is all about this collective intelligence and diversity itself in many forms, then the purpose is growth in service of student learning. I'll say that again. I think there's a singular purpose for teacher teams, teams of people who are in the middle of delivery of teaching and learning in some form to a classroom of some age and, and context, it's universal. I don't believe it's about bus timetables. I don't believe it's about yard duty. I don't believe it's about the wealth of agenda items that are thrust upon us that crowd out this core purpose. And I'd love your comments if, if you agree or not on this. The singular purpose that I believe that a teacher team has is indeed to improve delivery and engagement and connection with our students so that they improve the outcomes that they have in a wildly complex and changing world. Just look at our last six months in terms of AI, for example. So if I can establish that as the true purpose of a teacher team, 
then that says something about a leader of a teacher team, a middle leader, head of department, head of year two, head of well-being, all of these middle roles in educational structures that are not at that top tier. Really, the school thrives and you are the engine room of the school. The, the rubber hits the road with the work of middle leaders in many, many ways. So I'm just watching this. The collective intelligence is a major source of growth for any collaborative system. Thanks, Giraffe. Beautiful comment there. And I'm going to highlight that if I can. Um, lovely comment from Gaurav that it's the major source of growth for any collaborative system. Important to have common goal, but different perspectives to achieve it. 100% agree. And there's two sides of the coin. I believe that most things in life have two sides to a coin. And in many ways, if we have a diverse group of people, collective intelligence, diverse opinions, diverse backgrounds, diverse experience, then the challenge of that is harnessing that diversity so that it works for us. Because at times that diversity drifts into conflict and disagreement. So it's very easy to teach and work with and lead a group of people who are homogenous. But that remains a bubble and no change, no growth, no development could come out of that. So I uh, really appreciate your comment there, uh, Jeff. So if we move on then, and I'm just refining where I am on the screen, um, a question that I often ask of teachers, a really diagnostic question for me, is all about what value do you bring your students? And I'm assuming that as a middle leader, if you are watching this as a middle leader, and if you're watching this as a senior leader now no longer teaching, you can think about what value did you bring to your classroom. It used to be, as I said just before, the body of knowledge that I bring to the classroom. That was how I was originally trained in my first engagement as a teacher, transfer knowledge. Now, we know that that's not relevant anymore. And for probably the last 15 years, if not more, Mr. Google has replaced that role of a teacher. So if it's no longer necessary to be the container of information, and that's a simplified view of that position, what, what value would you see a teacher brings to their classroom? And it's quite a complex answer in many, many ways. But if I hear answers around facilitating learning, um, leading the way, knowing students, creating the space for students to thrive, um, all of these elements are much less definitive, harder to define, but start to get at that cliched quote of sage on the stage or, you know, guide on the side. It's that really strong position of a facilitative leader that helps bring students through challenge, normalises and permissions the challenge and the difficulty and the effort of learning, but supports emotionally and through knowledge of the student a coaching style engagement of leading the way so that kids themselves can collaborate and generate their own learning, generative learning forms, if that makes sense. So if that's the case, then what does that say, the same question about what value do you bring to those you lead? Is it purely instructional? Is it command and control? Is it the model of the captain at the helm you're in charge of the plane that's that's you know the ship or the plane um, you have that oversight and instructional role of really telling people what it is they should be doing that may have worked uh, and did work in our previous generations where we were not dealing with the level of complexity in the world that we are now so there's a slightly different if not a massively different way in which we must position ourselves in the act of leadership of others. And it's very similar. It's facilitative, it's generative, it's inclusive, and it's collaborative. And that really starts to position quite a different set of skills that many of, many of us have not been taught or have developed necessarily, organically maybe, but not strategically and intentionally. So I love that, uh, Mark, that one there. I'm just going to show that what values, as well as what value do you bring, what values do you bring? And uh, the whole exploration of values is a really important and hidden area of the mindset. And I'll talk about mindset and skill set a bit later on. Really appreciate that call out, Mark. 
So as we move forward through this, we've got this idea of, um, as we go, if your value is to create the space in which teams can live out there, what, sorry, I'll reframe that, what if your value is to create the space where teams can live out their purpose? Just to consider that. Interested to see whether you agree or disagree or whether you might nuance that. If you were to create the space, the mechanisms, the process, the culture where the team you lead can be in service of student growth, would that be a good way of defining this? So what I'm positioning to you is that if the team itself is in service of better student outcomes, so they meet a complex world when they leave school, then I believe the role of a teacher leader is all about creating the space. Now, in coaching, this idea of creating the space is literally setting up the culture, setting up the dispositions like trust and the mechanisms, good questions, good listening, good summarising, the mechanisms. So all of those things come together in creating the space for the coachee to thrive, connect their thinking and start to generate insights and new action. Now, in many ways, that's metaphorical or analog uh, analogous to what this creating space idea might be. So a, a quick check of the questions that might be coming through. Quite a different definition of the teacher leader role. And I believe that there are three problems that get in the way, particularly with young and new leaders. So I'm just going to go through three of the key problems that get in the way of that service orientation, facilitative style of team leadership, which embraces the challenge that comes with diversity, uh, diverse opinions, diverse approaches, diverse ideas, um, diverse brains, diverse experiences and background, as an example. So I've been working with middle leaders um, quite significantly over the, uh, the period of time since COVID and before then, um, my journey with middle leaders started uh, back in 2007-ish or so when working with John Corrigan and Group Age Education, we used coaching, teaching middle leaders to coach as a mechanism for informing and improving leadership um, ability and capability of these middle leaders. So I've been in this space really for the past 15 years or so. Thanks, Irene. If your mindset, I'll just show that to everyone here. So really appreciate these comments, by the way. If your mindset is collaborative, you see your team as a pool of talent benefiting your students. I love that approach. This empowers your team and encourages them to participate as well. And the reason I like that is that what we want are a number of things, participation, commitment, and I'll use a model that shows um, five of the, the dysfunctions of a team, if you like, that I often use in my training. You'll see that in a second. So to this first problem then, confidence and please excuse if you can hear the jets in the background i live close to pile Bear airport in uh, singapore and the 15 f-15s fly regularly as uh, some of you who know me would know so hopefully they're not too noisy in the background leadership confidence what i often see with young leaders especially and the pool of young leaders in our world is growing rapidly in parallel with the teacher shortage which means that often our teachers are becoming teacher leaders more early and with less experience. One of the foundational things I've discovered in working with um, teacher leaders in sort of middle to middle senior roles is this idea of confidence. So the situation is this, often these sorts of leaders new to the role or new to team, maybe even new to school, are often leading a team of people who are more experienced and have had senior roles before, who may have been leaders, even principals. They're certainly generally older than the new young leader. And what happens when these people are given the challenge of maybe calling out some unwanted behaviour, um, asking uh, someone to do something, a delegation process, or asking someone to complete a process, to hold someone accountable to um, the culture that you're developing, you get things like, who am I to ask this person these things because they've been in the job much longer than me. It expresses itself sometimes as an imposter syndrome. I'm going to be discovered 
that I'm not as good as these people who are older and more experienced. And this mindset stems from the assumption that age and experience equals merit and value. And there's a mindset that sits with this that prevents people from exercising the skills they learn with me, such as feedback, such as coaching, delegation, those sorts of things. What often they know how to do it, but what often stops them is this glass ceiling of this approach and disposition to, um, I think, less of myself because I'm younger and less experienced. It's not just reminding these people that they got the job on merit. Um, sometimes you'll get these conversations in the head of these young people saying there must not have been anyone else for this role if they picked me. So we work. We must work to this idea of uh, improving or not playing into this imposter syndrome. And that's a piece of work that I do in some of the courses that I lead. And we'll cover some of that in this course that I'm talking about. The second problem is the disposition to conflict and a preference for comfort. I've worked with a lot of young, in fact, this is not just to young leaders. This is, I think, in everyone. We don't like conflict. But the thing is that learning lives in discomfort. We don't learn when we're comfortable. So if there's a premise and a, a need for the team to improve something about the way it does its work individually and collectively, then that requires moments of discomfort which might involve moments of conflict. And I see some people seeking to keep the waters calm and avoiding conflict wherever they can, maybe even running and hiding in the cupboard. <coughs> Pardon me. And I also see some people overcompensating where they get too directive and too command and controlish, if that makes sense. And this requires an optimised position to this whole idea of conflict versus comfort. If we're going to grow as a team, there will be conflict. And it's about, you'll see one of the strategies I'll build in in a second that specifically addresses this. And it's two things, really. It's about how do we create the way in which we decide to work together? And then internally as the leader, how do I address this disposition of fear of conflict? And often if we run away from conflict, the outcome is that we remove the opportunity for learning. It's like feedback. Feedback is a very uncomfortable thing to deliver for both parties. But there's learning in the con sorry, learning in the feedback that we effectively deny someone if we don't expose ourselves to the challenge. So I talk about challenge rather than conflict. So Doha, um, some, some principals project this idea on new young assigned leaders, presuming they are less competent because they are young. Um, young leaders, thanks very much, Doha. Young leaders have a tremendous amount to bring. And whenever someone has a but statement, but I'm not as experienced, I like them to flip the coin and say, but what else do you bring? And that may not be immediately obvious to a lot of people, but there is energy, there's fresh insight. There are a whole range of things that are not seen as value when compared against the perceived value of experience and age. And that's that's an assumption and a, and a frame I'd like to challenge in the work of young leaders, if that makes sense. So the third problem is culture. And this one in particular is expressed through this idea of I have to prove myself, connected to number two, as you can see. So when young leaders naively feel that they have to prove themselves, that defaults often, not always, but often into a command and control type, captain of the ship type role, rather than a facilitative developmental um, creating the space type role. So contend with a lack of robust conflict discussion can equal a level of stagnation. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mark. Stagnation is absolutely the outcome from comfort. Um, and, uh, you know, we there, there's a piece of work that I'm building around the course instructional design that uh, we're doing at EduSpark, which is all around that idea of intentionally embracing the bit below the line that is full of frustration, confusion, lack of certainty, lack of clarity. That's where the learning lives. Clearly, we don't want the discomfort to become extreme and trigger fight and flight in people's brains. But we don't want people to be comfort, comfortable. So there's this band where the learning really lives. And as leaders in a team, we need to permission that 
and drive to it and embrace it. We won't enjoy it. I don't say let's enjoy the discomfort, but it's where our learning absolutely lives. So our three problems then in summary, leadership confidence instead of imposter syndrome, um, leaning into challenge around the, the um, diversity element rather than running from conflict or overbearing the conflict. And then finally, building a culture that's really um, inclusive and empathic. And this forms the basis of our three strategies that I'll get to in a moment. Just looking at that, Rikita, i uh, got some really good comments coming through here. So not always about age and experience. In fact, often not, isn't it? It's about upskilling oneself in the profession and having a growth mindset. Absolutely. And that growth mindset is actually embracing of dis discomfort, uh, Rikita. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I'm dyslexic and sometimes I want to read that as Rakita. So be apologies if I said that already. Um, Gurav, um, absolutely the only criteria should be enthusiasm towards achieving the goal. And I believe openness to new experience and change. Someone who I think is highly coachable is someone who has an open mindset, similar to a growth mindset. And if you are highly coachable, I think that's one of the foundations for being able to be shaped into an outstanding senior leader later in life. It's the closed mindset and fear of something that's different. Uh, and to add to that, one of the indicators of open, closed mindsets are the degree to which I attach myself to an outcome and define myself by an idea. If someone criticizes an idea I have and I attach that to who I am, then by default, they're criticizing me. And then I will actually start to feel threatened by that, which builds that closed mindedness dynamic. The people who are open minded have this element. It's not easy to do. Self-awareness drives this. But separating ideas, opinions and definitions from who I am as a person. And that means I can allow someone to even attack the idea, challenge the idea without me being challenged at all. So part of the dimension of development here for leaders as they go through life is to, in fact, have that vulnerability, which is an element where I'm not really talking a lot about today, but that's a key element here, the vulnerability to allow opinions pardon me, <clears throat> and ideas to be challenged. And the culture we want around conflict is actually around the ideas, opinions, around the cognition not around the person. And there'll be some people in teams where they are attached to outcomes, attached to ideas, and therefore they become some of the difficult people in a team to work with. Um, yeah, thanks, um, Ratika, lifelong learners. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, embrace, yes, embrace the discomfort. This is it's, it's something that surprisingly, um, Irene, that we, we don't fully... Um, build into our deliberate practice of learning as adults. And there are two things that I really talk about, in fact, three. One is whoever talks the most learns the most. So my discomfort with this sort of delivery is I'm the one who's talking. Now, you guys are talking asynchronously by text, which is some value, but generative conversation, making sense of something, making meaning of subtle difference, particularly either side of action, is where a lot of learning occurs. And that's why coaching is such high value. So if that's the case, then we also know that when things get a bit tough, that's when we learn most of all. So what we need is the ability to talk about, in a generative sense, about the difficulties. <laughs> that's where the learning will emerge. One more element is the presence of relationships, hence the idea of collaborative teams. Relationships help fuel the direction of travel through the difficulty. If we're trying to do something alone, and I'm div digressing a bit here, there's a worldwide phenomenon of people starting courses as asynchronous self-paced and they drop off courses because there's no relationship and there's no generative conversation. And so it's very easy for people to abandon their learning in that context, in that environment. If you've got a team of people who are addressing tactically a body of work as a um, as a course, for example, as a year two team, the learning relationships that are established within the team and even maybe the relationships with the facilitator, that becomes the glue 
the conversation and the embracing of challenge become the, the thing that drives people through the momentum of learning towards mastery of some sort. Apologies for that digression as we move forward through there. Um, I'm going to skip this slide I had prepared because I do want to give you the chance to look at some value here. Um, and so I'm going to go straight to this one. And let me just adjust where I'm sitting here. This is Patrick Lencioni's um, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's a really good body of work and it's formed the foundation of some of the team leadership um, framing that I do with people. And it's deliberately in a hierarchical pyramid. So absence of trust is the thing that upsets the apple cart for most teams. It's foundational. So if there's no trust in the team, none of the things above it can be executed or delivered. Trust and trust comes from empathy and trust comes from a number of things. Uh, I, I talk about trust as a standalone um, workshop sometimes. And in this course of work that I've got here, that will be a mini course in the program I'm talking about here. Then we've got that fear of conflict. Then we've got a lack of commitment an avoidance of accountability. And finally, at the top, inattention to results. So this forms, if we flip this, then we get the idea of actually what we should be doing is building trust, first of all deciding how we handle conflict and give it permission and space to live in our teams as a normal part of the stretching growth. I'm often reminded with a, a teenage son that this is a bit like this, you know, this whole idea of kids stretching the boundaries and the discomfort we go through in that exploration of where is the boundary now and has, should it be moved and all of that sort of conf, conflict between kids and parents is where the learning lives, isn't it? Um, as we go through that, when we can satisfy those bottom two layers, we start to build a connection and a commitment to us as a body of people with a mission. When there's a mission, it also helps shape the um, agreed energy uh, that we're going to spend on this collaborative approach. Holding each other accountability, uh, to sorry, holding each other, <coughs> pardon me, accountable is also something that's a key element of high-performing teams. And then this final idea of of attention to results. This works in, in high-performing teams. It works, uh, sorry, sports teams. Any sort of team that you want to frame this against, you will get this as a descriptor of poor performing or high-performing teams accordingly. Hi, Steve. Thanks for your um, uh, comment here. Having shared goals with shared accountability differentiates from teams from franchises. Very interesting. Um, that's about where the power sits in some sorts of ways. So it's a democratization in some ways from what I'm hearing you say there of that uh, ability, giving agency, uh, agency is a part of this conversation. Agency for the team members um, is really key here. I don't know if I'm misreading what you're saying there. So then this comes to the major model and just let me help my, move myself out of the way a little bit. Um, I'm using this wonderful app and if you want to know what the app is, certainly... Um, feel free to, uh, to um, give me a ping on email and I'll share what I do with this. So I'm going to move this around a bit. I'm going to make myself a bit small and move up to here because I want to talk about mission. And this is connected to this idea of the purpose of the team. The mission is all about the growth of the team so it can improve its service and being in service of student outcomes teaching and learning, well-being, a whole range of outcomes. They're not just performance, academic performance-based outcomes anymore, are they? So having a clearly defined mission, and I like the word mission because, you know, if we go on a bushwalk together, we've got that mission sense about things, haven't we? There's inherent action in the definition of mission compared with purpose. Purpose can be standalone and not drive to action, where this sort of sense of mission is all about embodying the journey that will go on and what is, in fact, our body of work. It's almost like stepping back and saying, imagine we're in December, looking back to the year, what would we have liked to have achieved? That's one way of getting at this mission idea. Um, and what I'm looking at here, I need to make my other, because it's really, excuse me, clicking the wrong button there. Um, it's about priority uh, and it's about learning action and it's about deliverability of results and improvement in some way. Um, Priority, the challenge for middle leaders is they, there may be, from time to time, things like bus timetables, yard duty, all of those operational things 
which can easily occupy our time, but I believe are of less value and are in less service to our students. They can be dealt with often in other ways. So the challenge for senior leadership and middle leadership is to open up the space for professional learning collaboratively, inquiry-based professional learning in the team meetings so that we are truly in service of improving the provision of all the things that kids need in um, their classrooms and for their outcomes. So if we move across to this idea of charter, and I've taken a while to find the right words here, and I don't know if I've established these, um, but the, these are the three strategies. Let's be clear. So it's about defining purpose, mission. The second thing is about creating the norms. Now, the model I love to teach to with this one is from a Canadian man that many people have not heard of, a guy called John Viveki. Uh, and again, reference me, connect with me, and I can put you in touch with all of the models I use in this. He's got a model, a very astute model called the agent arena model. And the agent is simply the people who act out particular roles. And the arena is the space. I began this conversation with the idea of creating the space. So the metaphor here is a football pitch whatever form of football you want to talk about. And that's the space. And we all need to know what that space is. We need to know what the boundaries are, what the goals are, pardon me, what the artifacts are, and what the rules are. So all of those things should be created by a leader of that group. So that means that everyone knows what the expectations are, how we should manage conflict when it arises, how we make sure that we remain respectful, how we engage in um, committed professional learning, how do we deal with various circumstances and pressures that come to the group, how do we deal with being honest and calling things out as they need to be called out. So that metaphor of the pitch, if we all have clarity that this is a football pitch, it has some boundary lines, it has some markings, it has some rules of operation, and it has some artifacts like goals and even um, you know, they're agents. I was going to say even things like referees. A referee is an agent. The players are agents. The, the uh, uh, spectators are agents. But we all understand collectively when we go to a football game that this is a football game. The analogy extends is that the, the analogy when I push this through to how this works with teams is that sometimes people turn up with a tennis racket and tennis ball and try to play tennis because we've not defined the arena if you can understand that metaphor. So hence, I think an essential strategy and intention in the first 30 days is to define the space in which we're operating during this time that we come together as a team and the things that we do for the team outside of that meeting time. And so that is, again, a process of conversation, generative conversation where everyone has some agency and some engagement in that so it's owned collectively. Think of this as an essential agreement that we often bring to students and to our classrooms so that kids know in that arena how we should behave and what will happen if we don't. All those things we do for classrooms if we're good teachers. Often we forget that when we work with adults in teams. So that essential agreement defining the space is this idea of establishing norms and um, starting with this whole idea of understanding the process and the protocol and working from there. So it's going to take a sip. Feel free to throw a question or a comment. Really appreciating the way that people are connecting here. It actually helps me feel, and it's one of the challenges here, as I said at the start, that am I just talking to this big void? But it's really lovely to have those comments. So the final thing that I want to talk about, and this is where we get at Lencioni's model, which I'll talk about in a second, empathy. Empathy is one of those things that's hard to define and hard to operationalize. How do we be empathic? And it's actually not what we say. People often say, well, it's about walking in you know, other people's shoes. And I don't find that satisfying as a description because as a leader, you can't walk in 10 pairs of shoes. Everyone's different. But the way you can start to get to that is simply knowing people. A quick story, and this football club's in the news at the moment. I'm an Aussie, obviously. And I grew up in Melbourne. And I follow a team called the Richmond Tigers. And they went from 
uh, also ran very low in the competition on their table to winning the premiership in one year, culturally on the basis of knowing people. When you know people, you tend to um, trust them more. You, and when you feel that they know you, that trust continues. So the elements of felt trust, felt respect, and felt, felt empathy, I believe, emerge out of the practice of knowing people. Really outstanding teachers, the ones that are in the top 1%, know their kids, not just the academic work that they produce, but they know about their kids, and those students know that their teacher knows them. Another way of illustrating the importance of knowing people is when you might be in a relationship, any form of relationship but significant, it can be romantic, family, friend, anything, when you have that moment, which sadly a lot of us have, where you think to yourself, this person doesn't know me. After all this time, they don't know me. It's quite chasmic in the sense of building a chasm. It's one of those moments that rocks the relationship. And so the, the mechanism and the process of knowing people, I think, is completely undervalued. And as a leader, in the first 30 days, we should be all about building mechanisms of knowing people. There's a, a wonderful um, uh, YouTuber and thought leader and content provider uh, who is all about uh, the idea of connect before content, Chad Littlefield. So if you look up Chad Littlefield on YouTube, you'll see a wealth of information about how to engage and connect at a human level with people before you get into content. So that works at a training level, and I've not had the opportunity at all to do this here, which is another reason why I'm discomfort with this, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the medium, but this means know people before you get into agenda. So do something that helps build the dimensions of knowing others and others knowing that you know them in your sessions. I always remember uh, when I was director of IT at the Australian School, our senior leadership team always spent the first 10 or 15 minutes doing something which was not on agenda task, if that makes sense, but simply that got us knowing each other more, sometimes light, sometimes more significant. But that built a sense of cohesion that bound us together in the mission we had. So knowing people helps achieve the mission. Knowing people helps to deliver our norms. When someone feels known, you can say something that's challenging to them. When someone is feeling like they're not understood or not known, you can't deliver the same degree of challenge, whether that's a growth challenge or a behavioral challenge. It works in the classroom too. The stronger the relationship, the better we can affect all of these things. So each of these elements are interconnected. And these are our three strategies. Create your mission. Establish norms. Spend time, especially in that first preschool week before school starts, getting to know your team. So I'm just taking time to uh, look at some of the comments coming through. So uh, thank you, Mark, for this one. Work on the importance of developing emotional intelligence. Absolutely. This is right smack bang in the, uh, the, the work of Daniel Goleman. And one of the things that we've got to develop here is that circle of influence, circle of control. And actually by knowing people more, you actually expand your circle of control and your circle of influence. So really important to do. Um, Ken Blanchard's situational leadership is fabulous. And in fact, I love Ken Blanchard's idea of um, picking up monkeys, other people's monkeys. If you want to look up Ken Blanchard, I forget the name of the, the book. It's one of the, his management books. But this whole idea of taking on responsibility for everyone else's problems, he's a great guy. So just looking at um, Gaurav, your comment here. As per my experience as a leader, I believe empathy is very important in terms of developing a good relation. Absolutely. It's the foundation of the relationship that's that's brought in. Um, mental well-being, work productivity is better. I'm just summarising here. Really building mechanism of knowing people is one of the major tasks in the initial phase, 100%. And it actually leverages off all the others as well. And a quick comment from Doha as well. Um, help them bridge perspectives with their colleagues. Absolutely. So there are a number of ways we can do this, um, Doha. There, there are, they sometimes 
in their poorest form become icebreakers. Uh, and that doesn't have that deep purpose. But if, if we reframe that whole idea of warming each other up into this relationship, simple things like two truths and a lie as an activity, there are a whole range of social construct in, uh, activities that you can build into a team that become enjoyable in their own right. There's a website called thursday.social, which is a lot of fun. And it's that element of truly getting to know someone better with a bit of fun that lifts the mood um, and builds that commitment. This is actually creating value for me. People then start to want to attend the meetings instead of being compelled to go to a meeting. I don't know whose work it was, but and it might be Richard Branson suggesting if, or it might be Elon Musk, if this meeting doesn't add value to you, you should leave. You should not spend any time here and waste your time if it doesn't bring value. Hence back to that original question of what value do we bring to our teams? And we want people to feel that value and come in. Thank you all for your comments here. So if we take a quick look here, um, and there's this idea of bridging these two key models here. Um, I'll just move myself across. So building trust works very strongly with empathy. Um, challenge and commitment, dealing with challenge, how we approach challenge is in the charter. And then building um, commitment and accountability is also in that broad culture, which emerges from the, the right-hand charter and empathy bottom empathy circles, and then the results really start to connect in with mission. So you can see how these two models are providing a bit of a, a roadmap for delivery um, in the sorts of mechanisms that we could work for from here. So as we move forward here, I, I want to talk a little bit about skill set and mindset. Skill set is about the what, and mindset is about, you know, What's my predisposition and value um, that sense underneath? A couple of stories here without divulging names. Um, as an example of the difference between skill set and mindset, the middle leader, any leader, needs to be able to deliver impactful feedback so that the other person is provided that moment of stretch and forward focus of where I'll grow next. Delivery is a problem because people fear saying something that's uncomfortable. And one of the things I do is teach mechanisms through a model called the Conversation Toolkit, which shows this sort of dance map model of how to deliver in a short amount of time with high impact, this whole idea of feedback. Now, I've been teaching that to the various cohorts, long form programs of small numbers of middle leaders um, from various schools groups. And these stories come from my experience in that. And so in teaching the whole idea of feedback delivery, I know that the people who I work with get it. They know how to deliver. We've practiced it. But often it doesn't emerge into practice. So here's an example. A fabulous young guy who had an ex-principal in his team who was creating some problems in that team. Um, some entitlement uh, maybe left over. I used to be a school principal. Not sure that's not our concern. Our concern is this young man who was new to role and in a coaching session, I said, what, what do you think needs to happen with this particular team member? They need to be given feedback. So what might be getting in the way of delivering feedback from that perspective? Um, who am I to give this person feedback? They used to be a principal. And there we have the mindset that I was talking about before. The skill set can be in play. The skill set can be present but the mindset presents, prevents its execution in that immediate context. So I think whenever we work with people in significant areas of growth that require a stretch in mindset, a reframe of mindset, then we need to involve ourselves in coaching as one-to-one -one conversations to help deliver that. But it starts to show why we need to work on both. And in fact, in our world of professional learning and training, it tends to be, as a general statement, exceptions included, of course, that it's a skill set delivery and what stops it being executed in the right situation is a mindset. So there are predispositions and mindset approaches that we look in these sorts of programs of work, which starts to help people be aware of the mindset that's in play, because often it's invisible. And then secondly, to challenge it. And then thirdly, to, to step out of it and move into 
um, a new mindset that is much more supportive of the role that is middle leadership. Mark, you, you spoke about Daniel Goleman's work. Um, the, a lot of that emotional intelligence is founded on self-awareness. And I believe self-awareness is a generative output from conversations that matter. So the more we talk about those sorts of situations, again, coming back to the, the, the power of whoever talks the most learns the most, when we start to access our internal less than conscious states, we can call up some of that content, process it and build our awareness. And so um, there are a couple of things that I think build um, self-awareness. And one is a mindful approach to things. Secondly, it's it's dialogue, generative dialogue that does that. So just looking now as we wrap up, um, I've got to the last slide in a second, which is all about the course that I've got that addresses this specific 30 days. But I would say it doesn't finish after 30 days. So if we come back to this model, then um, mid mid process in a year of work, when we've defined all of these, we've created this, this initial 30-day work, then the mission piece becomes reflecting on our mission, how we're tracking on it. So in the first 30 days, it's defining that mission, isn't it? After that, it becomes how we're going. What are our checkpoints? Also checking in, are our norms still working? How are we going with that? And knowing, checking on how well we know each other. So there are these checkpoints along the way that once we create this template for team collaboration with power and purpose, we then need to come back every so often, either as a leader alone reflecting on these or as an activity with the team to say, how are we going with each of these? Are there any things we need to tweak or change? Anything not working? That sort of approach is an essential part of this. So it's not just the 30 days. This will establish the foundation of the work for the rest of the year. By the way, in this, if I just move myself back to, if I describe a particular situation here, someone like I described just before that needs to be given feedback, please don't do that. So feedback really comes in two forms. It's please stop doing what you're doing or can you now stretch into doing this other thing? So it's sometimes a combination of both. But if you've got to give challenging feedback to someone and you've established the norms and there are some behaviours, maybe about respect, that are emerging in a meeting, in a one-to-one -one conversation, you can then use the group power rather than your positional power. Remember, as a group, we established the way that we'd work together is to always be respectful of the person and challenge their ideas. What I need to have to say to you is about giving you feedback that that seems to be not the case with yourself. What are your thoughts? So what I'm doing now is calling out the norm to help me hold someone in line when they do need to be called out. So the norm acts as a mechanism to help me maintain the role I have as a leader. That's further amplified by building strong relationships. And again, if I've got a, a, an empathically founded relationship with this person I'm calling out where they trust me, that feedback will land. If I don't have their trust, they feel like I don't know them, I don't understand them, then I may not have that same traction with that feedback. I can also call that into the mission as well. So you can see as a system of leadership, these three things really come into play in a powerful way. So just looking, a culture of humility and transparency, hugely important. Um, humility, vulnerability. Interestingly, that capacity to say to a team that you lead, do you know what I was wrong with that one? Or delivering a little bit of yourself that exposes yourself to some level of vulnerability. And again, I've seen some excellent leaders that I've worked under do this consistently. Not too much. It's like spice in a meal. If you add too much spice, it overpowers the meal. Vulnerability it should be carefully given but it means that we show emotions, we, we call them out and say, you can see that this is frustrating me, or I'm sorry, folks, I made a big mistake on that one. You know, those sorts of moments of humility and vulnerability hugely develop in power, in concert with knowing people, builds that trust, builds that humanity, you as a person. And it's, this is all human-centered is another way of talking about this. Thanks very much, Amy. I really appreciate you joining. So, just to wrap up, folks, um, 
I've got an early access form here. Um, the body of work I've been specifically talking about will be released in early June. I'm happy to provide early and free access to this um, to those who are watching here. And literally, there's an access form or email me. You can see Andrew at edgespark.world is one of the emails I answer to um, when I'm not struggling with so many spinning plates. Um, and that's, you know, if you want to talk further about this book of time with me, reach out to me and we can catch up. Um, Thanks, Irene. Yeah, also models accountability. Thanks, David, for being on. Um, and thanks, Doha, Gurav, Mark, Steve, um, Irene, uh, Ritika, all of the people who have added to the conversation. It really helps focus and generate the work. So if you lead people who are new young leaders or if you yourself are a new young leader, please get in touch. Fill out that form that you've got there. Um, find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm in many places and I'd love to talk further and I hope that this has been helpful in some way. So quick, just check in to make sure that there are no questions or thoughts that um, I can quickly follow up with before we finish. This is your chance to challenge me or to, uh, to make a comment about what value this session brought to you. So if that works, otherwise... Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Thank you for, um, for Dave Burke, who is running Ed Events, and this is coming through the Ed Events channel. And for those of you who would like um, maybe to be on um, Dave's podcast, he runs an excellent podcast, and he's always looking for um, leaders and, and domain and, and uh, expert leaders from, um, sorry, expertise people. My articulation is starting to fall away now. Um, please be in touch with Dave Burke. And if you want to be in touch with him, you can come through me or ed.events. It's a growing new platform um, for uh, building collaborative um, communities of, of people who are after connecting together in this very disaggregated world. Thank you, Ratika. Thank you, everyone. I'm about to end the call now. Um, thanks, Doha. Great to see you again. Great to have you here. I didn't see you, but great to be connected again. Um, uh, and hopefully this will trigger something for you as we move through the end of this year. And this will be a course that will be available specifically for the start of next academic year. Please stay well, everyone. Thank you for joining me. And please reach out with anything you've got. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.